if my records or my photos don't sell anymore, I'm perfectly fine with that. But if I start boring myself, I think that's more worrisome, to be honest. And that doesn't happen at this moment in time, from time to time, but not a lot. Hej och välkommen till en ny episode av Fotopodden. Idag har vi fått stort fint besök fra utlandet. Vi har fått fotografen Stefan Gerrits. Han är er egentlig nederländer, men bor i Finland, har jobbat i Dubai och runt omkring. Har vunnit priser i Norge i internationalt. Så vi är er väldigt stolta av att ha han. Welcome Stefan to us. Vi må ta den podcasten på engelsk för han är er ikke så väldigt god i norsk. Det får det ha sunskyld för. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, you have just won a prize in Norway for the uh, Nordic Nature Photographer Contest for macro photo or close-up photo. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that photography to start with? Okay. Mm? About a particular photo or... The about... one you won with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the one I won with was with the banded uh, Demoiselles. So it is, of course, a a species of uh, dragonfly or damsel fly, uh, flies to be more uh, precise. Um, it's an area quite close uh, to where I live, thank God, so I don't have to travel all the time like hundreds of kilometers. It's maybe a 20 minute drive. I go often early in the morning, especially around this time of the year, or maybe in a few weeks from now when there will be more flying. Early in the morning means for me, you know, two o'clock, uh, three o'clock, maybe maximum four o'clock, so to say, so I can find uh, the damsel flies when they are still sleeping. It's important because in practice, you'll have then the time uh, to take the photo. And of course, once it starts warming up, they start moving, you know, within the grasses or wherever they are. And that is the moment that you can take your shots. Uh, that particular photo I took um, with white backgrounds, I used two kind of technologies for that. I prefer using clouds, to be honest. So if I know there is a morning where it's kind of cloudy and the day before it has been hot, I know this is my time to go into the field. Um, this particular photo, though, was taken with a reflector behind it. So if it gives you the possibility to kind of isolate where there are a reflector behind it and take the photograph. But I do prefer the clouds usually, and then overexposure for the ones who do know my style of photography. So overexposure is one of the things I do often. Uh, and then I will try to kind of uh, wipe out uh, the clouds, which are still then in the photograph by overexposure. Mm. Yeah, We'll come back to the techniques afterwards. Yeah, okay, you, yeah sure, no yeah. problem. Uh, just, it was a nice introduction. Can you tell us a bit how you started with photography? Oh, that's an interesting question. I always I say that I started photography about 10 years ago, but I did say that also five years ago, but it's, it's kind of easy to mention, you know, just 10 years ago I started it. I was walking around in the area where I live. It's a, it's a town called Sundsberg. It's close to Helsinki, maybe a 20 minutes drive from there. And I heard a bird sound and I realized it's a black woodpecker. I had my camera with me which I normally don't have. And I wasn't taking photos a lot, a couple of times to a trip, you know, I took it like to Africa, but otherwise I wasn't really into photography. Um, nature, of course, I always liked uh, from being a child already, but I heard that black woodpecker, I tried to find it. Uh, suddenly I realized it's there in, in, in the tree. And I took a photo, not thinking about any of the techniques and the settings, and it ended up being some silhouette. And I looked at it, and my wife said, then, it's a terrible photo. And I couldn't stop looking at it. I, I I really liked that photo because it was, you know, just a silhouette of the bird, very simple photograph. And I thought, this is it. I, I love it. And at that moment, I think my passion for photography and in particularly nature photography was born. It was there. And since then, I haven't stopped. In the beginning, it was more about a ticking off species, I would photograph, not thinking so much about the technique. But I always started to think about that first photo I took, that I liked that so much. That's what's kind of sparked my interest in, in nature photography. So slowly but surely, I moved into that that kind of space of kind of minimalism, high-key and low-key photography. But that's that's how it started. But you do this as a hobby. You do not 
live yeah, make a living as a photographer? To be honest, it's a hobby uh, gone mad, to be honest. You know, it's it's very hard from a time management point of view. I have a daily job, which I like as well. Um, if I can mention the name of the company, it's Loop Deck, also active, of course, within the space of, you know, photography uh, too, with the small kind of keyboards they have. But I like it a lot. I'm writing articles for magazine. There was just recently an article published in uh, uh, Natur and Photo in, in Norway as well. I do it for two magazines in the Netherlands too, and I'm also doing it for the magazines in Finland. There will be three articles published later on. So I do all of that. Um, I sell my photos. So you can say once you start selling it, it is kind of your job as well, but it's not my major kind of form of income. In addition to that, I also organize tours. So it is going mad. Time management is an issue, to be frank. And also you have a family. With, with two children, <laughs> still young. Um, and that's also why recently I haven't photographed a lot, but now the days are getting longer, so I can get out of house early and come back most of the time before anybody has woken up. Of course, that will be a little bit tired than that day, but at least uh, I took my photos then. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I uh, looked up some of your pictures on the internet and as you say, they are either very high key or very low key. Some of them are without almost any environment whatsoever. Yeah. So it's like a, for an amateur, a bug on a straw. Yeah, <laughs> no, yes. Um, what separates that from uh, just a species documentation? I mean, when you have no environment, um, how do you, uh, I see that that is your style, but can you explain a little yeah. bit about how you think when you make these and why you make them that way? And yeah, yeah. yeah this is, I think, an extremely interesting question for me. It's, it's a question which makes me think about photography and most likely every day I might give you a slightly different answer as well. It depends, I think, a lot on, on the mood. In a way, so we'll ask you again tomorrow. Then. Yeah, ask me again tomorrow. <laughs> send me a note to give me a call. I would appreciate that. Uh, in the beginning, as I said, it was really about species. I wanted to see all the species. I had an Excel file with all the birds you could find in Finland, all the butterflies you could find in Finland, all the dragonflies you could find in Finland, and by the way, also in the Netherlands. But living in Finland, you know, it was kind of simpler to do it. Places where you could find them, and the only thing I did is put a, an X in the box once I had seen them and photograph them. But at some point, and quite quickly, that was already the case, that didn't satisfy me, the kind of document that it was not about seeing species, it was about capturing species, you know, in a in a photographic way, which gave me the satisfaction, not the axis anymore in, in the cell, in Excel. So then I started to ignore the fact that I need to see more species. I didn't care that much about the species. That's not 100% true. Of course, I do care about the species, especially when they are kind of interesting, kind of hard to find, for example, or maybe speak to somebody imagination, like, like, like birds of prey. Of course, I'm more interested in photographing these unique type of species, but I'm not a species hunter anymore. If somewhere, somewhere there would be a brown small bird, you know, which has flown in from Siberia and it has been the first sighting since 1967, I could not care less because photogenic wise, it is not of interest for me. So, yeah, and I'm not sure whether that answers all of the questions. So it's, it has become more of a capturing a species which speaks to imagination, myself or somebody else, in a different way. <clears throat> and that form of high key or low key kind of photography is something which has slowly come into me. And to be frank, I didn't even realize myself in the beginning I was taking minimalistic photos per se. Of course, I knew there were minimalistic photos, but I didn't realize it had become part of me, my style, so to say. It was only when somebody told me after I posted likely a, a photograph of a duck in a blue sea that, hey, Stefan, think about your style, think about your brand. And I realized... It's true, I, I do have my own style. I don't find it a brand that becomes commercial immediately. I'm Like I said, I'm not a professional photographer. I don't you know, see myself as that, but maybe style and, and brand is kind of close to each other at the end of the day. 
and myself also if i think about how our house is for example uh, decorated i don't like purple pillows at home they, they drive me mad I, I have always had busy jobs to be frank um, work for other companies like microsoft like nokia always busy jobs a lot of traveling and often I go and come home and I need kind of peace and quiet. For the kids, it's all, it's all fine, but it's the, the inside. It needs to give me this calm feeling, so to say. And I think that's exactly the same what I find in my photography as well. We can talk about the stars maybe later on, but no, for me, for me, mm. what is very important is this kind of simplistic style or, or, or minimalistic, however you want to call it, is to leave as much out from the photograph to focus on the subject and the subject only because it gives me this calmness over me. If I see lots of pieces of straw, especially if they are not in a certain form or shape, if they're all over the place, yeah, it doesn't make me happy, to be honest. It, it doesn't give me that peace of mind, which I like when I'm always in this kind of concrete jungle in, in, in Helsinki downtown or anywhere else or in any other city in Jakarta, Indonesia for work and then come home, I need to find that kind of peace of mind. And that's what I find really in photography, to be frank. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, it was a lot about, you know, high key, but then you start experimenting sometimes, but low key and making use of light sources, like whether it's the sun or whether it's something unnatural as well, like light coming, for example, from inside of the house, which shines towards a bird feeder outside. And you start playing with that and you find out that this dark kind of photography or low key photography gives me exactly the same kind of you know feeling of, of calmness too so it's about really isolating the subject at the end of the day but if if possible as little in the in the photograph as possible mm. yeah they, they are very they are very calm your your, your photographs um so you do would you say that you use the photography as sort of a therapy for yourself to calm down after stressful job yeah i think definitely mm. and, and without maybe realizing that in all fairness i don't believe i stress about my job i think i have passed that age i think when you are younger and you just start in business i think people are more vulnerable to stress uh, but when you hit a certain i think age level you kind of learn how to deal with that and and maybe part of that dealing is also finding the right escapes and and photography for sure has been one uh, for me yeah absolutely can you tell me a bit how you work what do you do to take such a picture how much is preparations beforehand how much is species knowledge or knowledge of the area yeah. where it lives and what do you technically do yeah that's confidential <laughs> no just kidding i i think l learning about the species is very very important but you don't learn everything from the book or by browsing the internet. It's also going into the field and often coming home maybe disappointed because you cannot find, let's say, butterflies. You don't know where they are resting. So it is going back and forth all the time. Learning about your subject, I think, is of critical importance. Patience is very important too. There are also moments that I take an empty A4 and I start drawing on it, but I think would be the ultimate photo, but it never works like that. You, you can have something in mind and how you would like to take the photograph, but very seldom I would say your visualization becomes reality because this is nature. You, you cannot plan how nature kind of reacts. I think you can have in mind when you are there and you see your subject, like what would you like to see disappear from the photograph and by Saying that, it means you find a different position. Maybe maybe one of the examples um, I've had from the last couple of years is photographing bearded reedling, um, one of the bird species, especially in the wintertime, which comes to the south of Finland and hangs in, in the reed beds. Many people are photographing towards the reed bed, and you would see the bird there, you would see the reed bend, but if you would take a photo, you would only see the bird and lots of reed. So out of maybe five, six, sometimes 10 photographers, I'm in a slightly different position. I'm, I'm sideways, I'm actually standing next to the reed. And it's all about patience that if the reed bends, and sometimes it doesn't, and I may come home with no photos, but if it does, then I have that 
isolation. I have only one read. I think it was, by the way, also published in the, the magazine, one of those photos, to Natur and Photo. Then I would have my photograph, banded read, one bird hanging from it, and not what anybody else would have had, just a lot of read and a small and a small bird. So it's a lot about preparation. It's about trying to do something different, standing in a different position and find out whether this gives you the opportunity to take a different type of shot. But of course, technology is also quite important. So I do underexpose a lot. I know there are people making jokes about it. I know Stefan Geddes, again, he has, you know, minus five on his EV. Absolutely. I shoot quite often, I would say, minus, you know, five EV at the end of the day. So fully underexposed on the current camera, what I have. I don't overexpose maybe that much because too much gets gets broken, I think, in the photo. Maybe plus three, sometimes plus, you know, maybe four at the end <laughs> of the so day. Not so much, maybe three or four, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I do that. And that's also with the, with the intent to kind of, you know, wipe things out. So if if there are small bits and pieces, let's say on a photograph, like like grass, if you do overexpose quite heavily, then those will not be visible anymore. And the same with underexposure. I won another competition, at least the bird category in the Finnish nature competition, which were two spotted nutcrackers kind of fighting each other. Um, the background were dark spruces, but if you would underexpose with, let's say, minus three full stops, then you would still see those trees in the background. It doesn't give me that satisfaction because it's busy. It's too busy. Mm. Well, then you go more extreme. Then you go to minus four. It's still not doing its job. You go towards minus five, trial and error. And then you do that and you see the sun coming in from the back. And of course, I know that the sun comes up there from the back. That's why I'm there at a certain hour. Then suddenly... You have that photo you want. Yeah, and it's a minus five on EV, but it does work. Mm. Not always. There are lots of photos I take, and they all go into the bin. But, you know, that's that's part of photography at the end of the day. And thank God we're living in a digital world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you use artificial lighting or natural lights only? I would say that 999 of the photos I take out of the 1,000 are done with natural light. Mm. I am terrible with kind of... Uh, artificial light um, even though I have to say I got myself recently a speed box I think that's the official name of it but I don't have all the lighting equipment yet to operate it um, I have used artificial light in my own backyard I have a bird feeding station in uh, in the winter time where also a roe deer is coming to um, I put the lights on very bright on the inside and I photograph then from my window so through the window towards the outside. So not a lot. Uh, that that gives me the possibility uh, to photograph kind of low-key type of a photo of a roe deer. I have once tried with a uh, construction lamp. Uh, I got blinded myself in not to think about what might happen, you know, with the animals too. So after 10 minutes, I aborted that kind of, you know, experiment because it, it just didn't feel right, to be frank. When you have the the totally white background, do you use something to... You said you sometimes use clouds, but that would normally leave something between your yeah. main motive and the background. Yeah. Uh, do you put something in between to, to remove things, or do you try to, no. to avoid that as okay. well? Okay, so now we go deep into the technology. I would say, again, you know, that's that's confidential, but of course I, I write about it too, so I, I will, you know, try to explain. You're absolutely right. You will never be able to clean kind of everything up. So the, the, the color which I dislike the most in any type of photography is blue. So often, you know, when you have, uh, when you're shooting uh, in a kind of overexposure manner, um, even though the blue clouds would become still very light blue, they're still there. So often then I do my work in Photoshop or, or Lightroom. So of course, I also do my post processing there. And in my post processing, I often take the blues towards gray to overcome that. So uh, they would kind of disappear. But I, I try to do, I would say, up to 90% in the photograph I take out in the field already, and the last 10% in Photoshop. Of course, there are photos, and it's kind of a hobby for myself as well, which I totally manipulate, you know, in Photoshop, just to see how extreme, you know, it can be. Sometimes 
you don't have the opportunity to take that clean shot what you would like. Of course, those photographs can never participate in a competition, and I think that's fair enough, but I do that too for the fun of it. But I will also talk about that openly. If there is one photo taken like that, which has undergone heavy post-processing, I will not lie about it. You use what you call in English negative space. Yeah. A lot I've seen yeah. the the image of the oryx, the antelope in the desert. Oh, you've seen which that. Which is yeah. 99%... Yeah. Empty desert yes. and 1% antelope. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me a little bit how you think around the empty space or negative space? Uh, well, again, it's it's not something I, I think about per se. Nowadays, maybe, yes. But in, in the beginning, when I took that photograph, I didn't think about that at all. I was living in Dubai back then. And by the way, I'm surprised you have seen that photo. It's one of the... I would say early photographs I took, which also got awarded. It was hanging in a gallery in London too, to my own surprise. Uh, I participated in the competition with that and I won a category. That was one of the best days definitely in my life. I didn't expect that. But I knew that there was a place where oryx uh, could be seen, endangered species still in, in the Middle East. And, and I went there with a, with a friend of mine in the car and then suddenly this oryx walked up the dune. It's like, you know, something you hope for. It's not something I would have expected to happen. And I, I took the photograph and of course the Oryx was quite far out and I started to play with the focus points, you know, in the middle, left, right, and I placed it all the ways on the right. And again, this is one of those photos that I showed and, and he said, no, that, that's, a, that's a crap photo. And I thought, no, it's not. This is great. This talks about the empty space. This is what the desert is called in that area, kind of, you know, going into Saudi Arabia. It's called the empty quarter, empty space. Um, I have to check that up. You should have given me that question, I think, on beforehand, and I could have found <laughs> out what the official name is. Empty space, empty no, no, quarter. Much better like this. So I thought this mm. resembles exactly it and how fragile also nature can be. So I think most people want to get as close as possible to a subject. Uh, but I, I, I don't believe it shows how fragile our nature actually is by showing how small something can be, how delicate, how fragile it is, I think it has more impact at the end of the day. Yes, I understand it's great to see details as well from certain subjects, but the strength is to show fragility in our nature. I think only then people will start respecting it because it isn't so that everybody can take close-ups. You know, it's not how nature is. It, it is hard to get to. And we've seen all the close-ups, haven't we? Exactly. Mm. That That's what I think as well. I try to do it sometimes too. Um, I don't have the right equipment for that, I would say, uh, or then I also feel it's often not right, especially with bird photography, uh, owls, for example. People like to get very close, but often the, the, the animals give us the warning that don't come closer, they may fly off, but then you see everybody moving again, you know, in the direction where the bird flew to, and sometimes it's not the right thing to do. Uh, rather than take that photo uh, at a bit more distance, to be frank, and if then one tree is there too much, okay, forget it. I'll, I'll take it off in post-processing necessarily. But I think it's important to show the fragility of nature. Hence, you know, negative space kind of resembles that. And it's not something, as I said in the beginning, I think about when I take the photo. It's more in the system. Mm. There are millions of nature photographers out there. Uh, we have seen billions, literally, uh, nature photographs. How do you... I, and I think you, you separate yourself with your minimalistic mm -hmm. uh, photographs, but and that has become your style. But are you afraid of getting locked into that or people getting enough of that style? Like a, a rock band, if they yeah. release one record after the other and they yeah. all sound alike people get bored. Mm. How do you renew yourself and still stay original mm. in a world where there's so m much competition? Yeah, to be to to answer that honestly, actually I don't care. It's about what I want. And you know, it's it's not something what I do uh, commercially, at least not yet. Um, so to be honest, I don't care. But of course I think about it too and it's more about do I bore myself with my style of photography? I, I think that's a more relevant question for myself. And 
yeah, I do sometimes bore myself with the same subject in a slightly different way. Of course, I like to innovate over and over again. And that is what I try to do. I also find inspiration in looking at what other photographers do, uh, not with the intent uh, to copy, but to get new ideas. I think you should be open for that. I love reading magazines about photography and learn about new techniques as well, you know, whether this is, you know, second curtain kind of camera technology, anything else. I like to learn about that and think, is that something I'm interested in myself too? Sometimes yes and sometimes it's no, but at this moment in time, it's not about what others think about it. And if my records or my photos don't sell anymore, I'm perfectly fine with that. But if I start boring myself, I think that's more worrisome to be honest. And that doesn't happen at this moment in time from time to time but not a lot would you like to do this full time as a living if you got the chance if i would have the chance yes i, I i'm interested in doing that not now uh, maybe in a year or, or four or five from now uh, it is interesting though i also um, do uh, photography tours I kind of asked to do that. People have said, you know, I like to take, you know, similar photos as you do. You know, can I come on one of your trips? And then I thought, okay, let's set something up. And it was kind of, you know, immediately, well, sold out, so to say, the year after again. Then another company asked me if I would like to do something for that. So it, it, it is very easy. But going on a trip and be kind of independent and take the photographs you want is wonderful. Kind of tour people around and take them to places where you have been and not be able to take photograph yourself, it's something different. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's a question I need to ask myself, is that what I want to do? Does that give me enough satisfaction? And, and sometimes it does, but there are also moments that, that it doesn't, but I'm sure that every professional photographer has exactly mm -hmm. the same thoughts as well. And often becoming professional is a hobby gone mad. And I think that everybody will ask for themselves the same question that once they have gone professional, is that something which gives them the same satisfaction as what they got when they were not professional? Mm. But yeah, Let, let's see. I think time will tell. It's, it's, not, it's definitely not a must for me. Because it takes away your freedom and your ability to take the pictures for yourself. Yeah, totally. I mean, unless you're a genius and can yeah. do it for yourself yeah. and they still sell like, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, then you will have to commercialize it in yeah. a way and yeah. think about what do people want not what do i want yeah and that loses some of the the inspiration or the spirit or the therapy or yeah. whatever definitely but then you get other things out of it so you're absolutely right but you get other things out of it what's better sitting in an office the whole day or being out in nature mm. i think you know being out in nature is great that you cannot then take the photos yourself it's maybe also depends on the weather if you ask oh, for definitely <laughs> it depends on, on that for sure but I, I guess that you need to decide yourself you know to find the right balance okay you don't have that full freedom that when you do go out but now you can be out more often so you need to find the right balance with that and i guess also that will take time to find, you know, what is that right level of balance uh, for yourself. But but time time will time will tell. It's a hobby gone mad and at the moment it, it doesn't seem to stop. So, yeah. Do you have um the ultimate photograph that you in your head want to make or dream of being <laughs> able to make no. or go constantly hunting for or No. No, I don't have. Like I said earlier, Th there were days that I was kind of drawing what I had in mind from a photography point of view. No, I, I don't have that. Yes, there are still, of course, species, even though I don't have that species list, which I would like to photograph because I think they are photogenic. So that that is, of course, something I'm, I'm very interested in as well. And that could be in Scandinavia still uh, i like scandinavia a lot the kind of arctic feeling because of course it help, help, helps a lot with my minimalistic style of photography but it could also be species which are kind of harder to get to i would love to go to madagascar for example to see what i can do with my style of photography there in a the rainforest i would love to go to costa rica to see what i can do with my style of photography with hummingbirds for example so i i, I do have dreams to capture certain species even though not the species hunter and to see how my style would work with those uh, but if you then talk about 
certain kind of animals which I really have high on my wish list in whatever shape or form, polar bears, for example, or Arctic foxes. And I know you have them here, of course, in Norway or on Svalbard at least. Um, yeah, that is something we, what I really, really would love to do. Hmm. Yeah. Do you feel you can go some of these places, go to Costa Rica or Madagascar for three weeks and do the job? Or do you have to live there to know the environment and know the species and know when they come out? And know? <clears throat> I would have to rely on experts, I would say. And that's something which I have realized as being a, a tour guide as well or a photography guide, uh, taking people to places. They rely on you 100% that you take them to the right places at the right times and they go home happy with great photos. And the fact that I know that, that people rely on, on, on me or that people help me with, with those tours also makes me realize that you have to rely on local resources. I would not need to go and live there, but if I would know that somebody can do the job, maybe based on the reference somebody has given me, then that would be the way to go. So two or three weeks should be enough. Yeah. yeah. Are you the terrible family man that takes your family on on a family trip and then you say, stop here, I have to wait six hours for the right light, so sorry. Uh, or do you sort of blend in with the family and yeah. go out in the yeah, mornings? Yeah. It's, a, it's a great <laughs> question. I think I used to be, I, I really used to be when the children were, were, were younger and that I had my camera with me on, on, on trips or we would even go, you know, for a walk somewhere and then realized that I was standing still maybe for half an hour and everybody else was freezing, you know, so, but not anymore. So I, I normally don't take my camera at all anymore. And of course, then I get blamed for not taking pictures of the family. That's also fair enough, but I've made a decision when it's, when it's family, it's no camera. And that's why I just don't take it with me anymore. Nature walk, whatever. I will not take my camera with me. It doesn't go hand in hand, so to say. We're all nature-minded, which is great, but it doesn't go hand in hand. Do you do any other kind of photography? Do you do weddings or street photography or...? No. No? No, not no. at all. Not at all. No, no. So if someone approaches you and says, oh, we're getting married next month, can you please, you're such a great photographer, can you yeah. please do it? And it's your cousin or your second cousin or whatever. I'm afraid of those. I, I get those questions, to be frank, and, and whether it's, you know, my daughter's, ice skating team I need to photograph or then, you know, a birthday from grandmother who turns 90. I do get that too. And people have expectations because you are apparently an expert. I don't see myself like that. I go crazy with people because they don't stand still, you know, they don't listen. It, neither do it, animals. Neither do animals. <laughs> neither do animals. But uh, yeah, no, it, Terrible, mm. oh, terrible. Yeah. So you can just say, I only photograph bugs and you're not a bug, are you? Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else you want to add before we wrap up? No, well, I, I'm, I'm honored, of course, uh, to be here. It, it's great. Uh, I love Norway. I've been here quite a few times. I'm, I paid him to say that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, and I, I'm just thankful for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Really enjoyed it. Uh, the address to your website? You can give it to our listeners yeah, now. Yeah, it's stefangerritz.com. Yep. You can also find me, of course, on Instagram as well. I think it's stefangerritz underscore photography. That should be it. And uh, yeah. There's lots of inspiration to find there. Thank you very much for coming, Stefan. Tusen takk til alle dere som hørte på og så på. Vi ses igjen i neste episode.